All right, today we're gonna to talk about faith over doubt. I wasn't gonna do faith over fear, because you know, as preachers, we like that alliteration, but I think doubt is a better word. And so what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, the birth of Samson um, in Judges chapter number 13. Um, this is a very particular, this is an interesting text because it's in some ways very similar to in some ways, it's similar to Mary's text. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But the reason why I want to lift this up is I feel like Samson's birth sometimes gets forgotten when we start thinking about the miraculous birth, right? We remember Sarah, we remember Hannah, but it seems like we don't remember Samson's mom, Samson um, birth. And maybe it's because Samson's mother goes unnamed, right? We tend, I mean, but you know, we, went, we remember the woman at the well, you know, we remember the woman caught in the act of adultery, even though they don't give their names, we still remember them. And so, uh, but I want to look at Samson's mom. That's really going to be our focus, to be honest with you. Um, so let's get started. And then we'll, I'll explain a little bit more as we go. All right. All right. So in this, in this whole, we're going to look at the whole chapter, actually. Um, and there's three main characters. There's Manoah. There's Manoah's wife. That's Samson's mother. We, they don't really get, they don't give her name. It just says the woman or Manoah's wife and the angel of the Lord. All right. There's the three main characters in this chapter. So let me get to you all because I won't jump ahead of myself. You say Manoah, the angel of the Lord and Samson? You well, no, Samson, Samson, even, he's mentioned, but he hasn't born yet. So Manoah's wife is what they generally refer to her as. Or the okay. or the woman, they don't give her name. All right, so let's give the setting of what's going on. So here in this particular, so we know uh, when you talk about the book of Judges, what is the one line that's said over and over when they're talking about the time of the judges? Israel did what? Israel was without a king. Well, close, but they would always say, everyone did what? according to what was in their own hearts right so so that's what we're seeing here israel goes through a series of they will be doing what's right they would mess up god would lift up a judge that judge would get them get them right 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 right, right. Their season they would mess up and then you know god would have to send another judge and so they did what's the text always says they, they did what was right in their own mind. And if we are quite honest with ourselves, a lot of people love doing what's right in our own mind, right? We, <laughs> we want to do what we think is right. So that's the setting. At this point in time, Israel is being ruled by the Philistines. So uh, the Lord, a lot of times, will use our enemies to teach us a lesson. Uh, we often hear people say, oh, we're the head, not the tail. No enemy's going to, but sometimes God uses bad, what we consider bad things to accomplish his mission, right? Remember, yes. he used the Babylonians to punish Israel. He used other people to punish Israel. If you're not, if they didn't follow what the Lord said, he, he was not opposed to using people who didn't believe in him to accomplish his divine purpose, okay? And he said, because uh, they constantly kept drifting away from God. And, in, and what's interesting in this particular account, uh, we're going to see they seem content with being ruled by the um, Philistines. If you look throughout the book of Judges, you would oftentimes hear them crying out to the Lord, crying out to God, and God would uplift somebody to save them. In Samson's day, you don't really see that. It almost appears as if they're comfortable in being in this oppressive state. You hear people say a lot of times that you can get comfortable in bad situations. Yes. You you ever heard the story? There's a story. I mean, there's a little story people tell you about if you take a frog and you throw him into a pot of hot water, he'll hop out, right? But mm -hmm. if you put the frog in the water and slowly turn up the heat, you'll eventually be able to cook the frog without him realizing he's being cooked because he'll just continually to adjust to the temperature of the water, not realizes that it's slowly killing them. 
the same thing with us. Ooh. We get in bad situations and we keep adjusting, adjusting, adjusting because it'll not realizing it's killing us, right? Bad relationships, mm -hmm. bad friendships tend to corrupt us and we don't realize it because we grow comfortable to it. Okay. So let's continue on. All right. We're going to get straight into the text. We're not going to do, I know I have all, I usually do these long uh, intros. We're not going to do a lot today because we, we want to accomplish this in a reasonable amount of time. So somebody read for me Judges chapter number 13, verses one through five. One through. One through five. One through Here's five. Here's the results from the web. Okay. Uh, now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old no. and stricken. You in Judges 13? I'm in Joshua. <laughs> I don't even. I can't even find the right book today. I'll see here going like. But you say, "Whoa!" Yeah, like, <laughs> <"Ooh."> <laughs> How many days, Father? No, it's all right. Yeah. Judges all right. thirteen. What's Judges five? thirteen. It's on the screen if you want to use that too. That's why I was skimming through that while you was giving an introduction. I was saying, <laughs> "Wow." And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zoroth of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not any wine or strong drink, and eat not any unclean things. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto, the, unto God from the womb, and he shall be Again, to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. All righty. So here's what we got going on here. All right. So just like I said, the, the Philistines have been ruling over Israel for the last 40 years. Okay. And just like I said before, notice that this text doesn't open with, and the people of God cried out to God. That's something you would see common as a common theme you would see uh, a lot of times in these texts. But no, notice that it just says that Lord, the Lord is raising up. I mean, he's, he sounds like he's going to raise up somebody. So he sends the, he sends his angel to a certain man. Now, notice I want you to notice something. One many things we notice about the Bible is the Bible is very male driven, right? Uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of female characters who they don't even give names to. And Samson's mother is one of them, right? They don't give her name, but just because they don't give her a name, it doesn't take away from her significance. I want y'all to pay attention to this throughout this whole exchange that's getting ready to happen. Even though Samson's mom is not named personally, she looks appears to be the person that the narrator is lifting and Samson's father, maybe not so much, right? All right, so now notice when, they, when the narrator announces him, he says a certain man of Zora. He doesn't go through and give Samson's dad whole lineage which you normally would do right he's the son of blah 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 the son of so-and-so the son of so-and-so right he's just mm -hmm. a certain man showing that maybe he's not that significant to the story and then he called he says from a clan of the Danites. i don't even think he gives his clan name or he just says that or he's saying that the day the net the tribe of dan is just a clan right mm -hmm. now notice he said he had a wife who was childless and unable to give birth so that lets us know that they were trying to give birth but haven't done it as of yet right what you have to understand is childlessness in those days is 
it's similar, but it's different. So if you were childless in those days, it was seen that you were being cursed by God or, or the gods, because even if you were in the polytheistic uh, thought process, they believed that the gods controlled that. That's why a lot mm -hmm. of people worshiped a lot of those foreign gods because they promised uh, fertility. And if you're thinking about it, if you're a farmer or you're somebody who gets their money from the ground, fertility is an important thing. And there was no social security back in those days, okay? No one's gonna send you a check every month. So your children were also your security in your old age. Once you got to the point where you could not work, your children would take over and you could, you know, kind of relax in your latter years and your children would do the work that you used to, you know, the work now that you, since you can't, if you can't physically do it anymore. So not having a child was a big thing in those things. And you got to remember, this is also a, a um, patriarchal society. So father, I mean, um, so land was passed from father to son. So if you had no sons, you had nobody technically to take the pass the land over to because in those days, I don't know if they allowed, I mean, there were one, there was a few females in the Bible they allowed to have um, land, but for the most part, land was passed from father to son. Yeah. So, so not having a son, I mean, not having any children, especially not having a son. Now daughters were important too, because daughters were the ones who did a lot of the work in the household and kept help maintain the household. This is why uh, when a young lady got married, the father of the groom would give the father of the bride a dowry. The dowry is kind of saying, here's something to compensate for a worker that you're losing in your household. I know that sounds cold, but that's kind of how, that's kind of why the dowry was in place. You're losing some help in your household by you marrying off your daughter. Let me compensate you for what you're getting ready to lose. That's how they looked at it. Okay. So, Here's the other thing I want you to notice that now look what the angel says to her when he first sees her. He says, you are barren and childless. I'm, I wonder if uh, Samson's mom was like, I know this. <laughs> you don't think I've been dealing with this for a while? You don't think I've been hearing people talk about me behind my back? You get what I'm saying? Like, this is something she would have known. What's also interesting is the narrator does not state that the mother and or Manoah ever asked for a child, right? Because if you remember a lot of the children narratives, the barren narratives before, you look at uh, Hannah, she's, it talks about how she's so distressed that she didn't have any children. Sarah, same thing, right? Abraham was distressed about it. You don't hear that in this text, which is interesting. A lot of times you read the Bible, you have to look at the stuff you see and the stuff you don't, and kind of think about the stuff you don't see. You don't see her saying like, oh, you know, we'll see that as we go on. She's not you know, not saying she's not excited about the hearing she's going to have a child, but she's not, you don't hear anything about her longing and praying for a child. All right. Pay, I want you to pay attention to that. Okay. So it, look what he says to her. He says that you'll become pregnant and you will give birth to a son. Now see that it is that he doesn't drink wine or fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. Okay. Um, and you will become pregnant and you have a son whose head will never be touched by a razor because the boy would be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. Okay. If you go back to the time of Moses, God gives this um, rule that, you know, uh, there are people who a lot of times want to get baptized again, right? They say, oh, I got baptized when I was 20. I drifted away. I done came back to God. I want to get baptized again. And we don't really believe in that. You know, once you've been dipped once, that's good enough, right? So in those days, they had what was called like a Nazarite vow, which is kind of like saying, I'm really trying to get close to the God, close to God for a season. So what you would do is you would make a vow um, saying, hey, I'm going to do the Nazarite vow for 45 days. You would do the vow, a certain process that you have to do. I don't want to get too deep into it, but it was only for a short period of time. Notice the angel is basically telling the mother, this boy is supposed to operate as a Nazarite from the time that he is born, right? Mm -hmm. from, the moment of his, from the moment of his conception, he is supposed to operate like that. 
And so that means that she had to follow the rules too. Yes. Look what he says. Now see this, that you don't drink wine or fermented drink and that you don't eat anything unclean. That's important too, because that rule should have went without saying, but the fact that the angel was saying this must have meant that again, since Israel had drifted away from God, they had, they weren't following all the rules of God. Cause I get it. You, you know, you rule by the Philistines. They're over there frying up some bacon. You probably like, Hey man, what you got over there? Take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> Come on, real Williams. They got some ribs on the grill. They like, hey, y'all want some? I ain't supposed to eat that, but uh, let me know your little taste. <laughs> so it looks like maybe the mom or maybe the household wasn't following the rules like they were supposed to. Right. So it's, and look what it says. A son whose head is to ever be touched by a razor, meaning he should never get his hair cut. And look, he'd be dedicated to God from the womb. And he would take lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistine. So not only does this child born is supposed to be set apart, he has a purpose, but uh, he's set apart. He's also supposed to, be, he has a purpose. His purpose is to over, to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Hmm. Now, we won't get too deep into Samson's story. Please read it. It's very interesting. And I want you to rest, when you read it, wrestle with the question is, does Samson actually live up to his calling in life? There's a lot you can learn about Samson from, about a lot you learn about calling looking at Samson because he's basically called just like John the Baptist from his, the point of conception, from you know his announcement is before he's even in the world. And so are we oftentimes, you know, if we are being called, do we live up to our calling? Samson, Samson might be a case study in that. All right. Somebody read verses six through seven for us. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very handsome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazareth of God from the womb until the day of his death. All right. So remember I told you about that Nazarite um, process. Like I said, it's only supposed to be for a short period of time. Notice, Samson has no choice in this. The mother has no choice in this. God is telling them what to do. We oftentimes forget who's in charge <laughs> of the situation. Uh, that's we often forget that God is the one who's in charge. And if he says something, he means it. If you remember, what is the first thing that Satan does to get Eve to to want to we always say apple want to eat the fruit from the tree he gets her to doubt the word God. of God is that what God really said and if you think about it people still do that today right when people want to question Christianity or our religion first thing they say is how do we know that the Bible is the truth you know, it's been changed. They took out books. How do we know this is the word of God? Right. And so if you're defending, if you're trying to defend the word from that aspect, you already know this, you know, it's kind of like, maybe this is a lost cause from the gate because it seems like you're doubting what the Lord says. We have to remember God is still in control. Even in this situation. All right. God is showing is God. We're going to see how God is showing them that he's still in control. I don't want to go too fast. Any questions, comments? I know I'm rolling, but anything anybody got want to, they want to say or chime in with? Uh, not at this point for me. All right. Let's keep going. All right. Somebody read 18 through 12 for us. Okay, then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. 
And God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband, Manoah, was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that govern the boy's life and work? All right. Now notice this, right? The wife doesn't question the angel. The first thing she does is go and tell Manoah the good news. So what does Manoah do? Pardon your servant, Lord. Could you send the man back to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born? Now, did his wife just tell him what they were supposed to do, right? Yes. It shows you sometimes that even if you are, as Sister Ruby said this morning, a credible witness, people will still doubt you. Amen. And so Manoah teaches us that doubt even amongst people is always prevalent, right? And so listen, now look now, God doesn't do, uh, the angel doesn't do, God doesn't do him like uh, Gabriel did uh, John the Baptist's dad at Silas him. He heard him. The text says what? He heard him. But look what he did. The, the, the angel appears to who? The woman. Again, right? Yeah. Notice that. He didn't, even though Manoah prayed, the angel appeared to the woman again. It's almost as if the woman's faith was way stronger than Manoah's. Because look what she says. She said, when he showed up, I didn't ask him where he was coming from. I didn't ask him where he was going. I didn't ask his name or any of that, right? I just came and reported to you the good news. I wonder why she wanted to go back and get her husband. Well, he was the one who had requested to send him back. Well, I, I'm, I asked the question now, it came to me. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was a conversation afterwards. You know, maybe we're not privy to the pillow talk between Manoah and his wife. He was like, I saw, mm -hmm. I saw, you know, a holy man. He's like, girl, that man, you know, he ain't had, he ain't, we ain't getting ready to have no baby. Lord, now, I'm just going to check in. If this woman telling the truth, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. I beg you. That's not what the text is saying. But he's look, 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 he says, pardon your servant. Like, hey, you know what, Lord? Could you send the old boy back again so we'll know how we should raise this child up? Right? It's almost as if, because now she told him what we just saw in the previous verses. She told him pretty much exactly what the man said, right? What the angel said. Yes. But, she, but he didn't, but now he, but he's praying to God that he gets a word as to how to raise the child. I want you to notice how he's putting on airs as if he's being pious, but really it's covered in doubt. We do that a lot too, right? Lord, yeah. I know that you could do all things, but could you give me a sign? Isn't that kind of, <laughs> isn't that showing a wee bit of lack of faith to ask for a sign, even though you say it, that you believe that he can do all things? Could it also be asking for help? Could be, but you gotta, but that's why I, the reason why I'm getting to that is the Lord knows your true intent of your heart. So don't try yes. to mask your doubts and things uh, as if you're being pious with it. You get what I'm saying? Uh, I've heard people say, well, I pray to the Lord, he bless other people. So that way he can bless me. And I'm like, that's probably not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> and, uh, I agree. So the point I'm trying to say, I, I think the Lord rather you be like, uh, the father of the little boy who was having seizures and saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. Right. I, I, I think the Lord will appreciate you better if you were honest, even when you have doubts. Do you get what I'm saying? God can Amen. deal with your doubts. The challenge with many of us is we don't want to put our doubts out there. We, you know, we're like, oh, you know, especially in the church. Because God is good. Yeah. We'll, we'll, 
we'll ma- we'll mask it with some Christian cliche or something like that instead of just owning up to our doubts. Especially now, here's where in the church where we tend to have a lot of doubts when it comes to the finances. That's when the doubts get heavy. <laughs> And I, you know, I'm not trying to be funny, but that's what happens when it comes to the money. All of a sudden, ooh, we can't do that, Rev. Williams. You know, we ain't never had. We, you know, come on now. We got to, uh, we got to remember the same faith you have that God will get you out of the hospital. You have that same faith in God providing for you when He says He says He is. He says He's going to provide. He's going to take care of you. You got to trust the Lord. Now I'm not telling you to go be crazy let me say to me qualify this i'm not telling you to go out and just say well the pastor said just give away all my money because the lord gonna provide no i'm not telling you to do that (laughs) what i'm saying to you is to do anything of the lord is going to require you to go beyond your comfort zone you're going to have to stretch yourself he um i just got finished reading barbara brown taylor's book when god is silent and one of the things she says in there which i found interesting she said, sometimes God goes silent to kind of get you to come closer or deeper into wherever he's trying to take you. Because if you ever notice, I know it happens with me in those moments where anything big is getting ready to happen. God goes stone silent. I mean, he gets quiet and it's weird and it's unsettling. If you're used to hearing from God or having a warm and fuzzy from God on a regular basis, when he goes silent, that thing drives you nuts. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, God, um, what am I supposed to be doing? Also, we ain't talking now. <laughs> it's a weird what call on me? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. When God really is trying to drag you into a place of of a new level or something new he's trying to bring you to, sometimes he gets silent. Mm-hmm. I can think about many of the big decisions I've had to make um, as far as ministry and stuff goes. God goes stone quiet. Now, what I don't what I don't realize is he's working things out in the background. But to me, he's quiet. And it's, you know, and I, it's unsettling and I don't like it. <laughs> All right. But look. And so he so look, Manoah sees the man. He says, you're the man who talked to my wife. I am. Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what should be the rule to govern the boy's life? So I should have, I should have added that verse to this next section. Let's go to the next section. All right. Somebody read that for us. Okay. I was waiting on somebody. I don't want to do the angel of the Lord answered. Your wife must do all that I have told her. Oh, she must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine or drink any wine or other fermented drinks nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that this was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that we may honor you when your words come true. All right. Um, Let's start right here. It says, uh, your wife must do, now notice what he does. He literally repeats to Manoah exactly what he told the wife. In other words, he's like, only other, only extra instruction you're getting, only instruction you're getting is confirmation for what I already said. See, oftentimes mm-hmm. we want the Lord to, you know, there's a, um, there's a, I think it's a YouTube channel or something. And it literally goes, explain it to me like a six-year-old. <laughs> and it gets like very, very smart people to try to take these big concepts and break it down to you like in a very uh, basic level so that way you can understand what they're talking about. It's an interesting yes. series. And so sometimes we want God to do us like that. Like, okay, Lord, explain it to me like I'm five. <laughs> what are you doing now? And so, but he does nothing but confirm the word he already gave her, right? Many times, 
we want a new word. You know, people say, oh, Lord, I want a new word. I want a fresh word. God is like, just do what I already told you. <laughs> no, <man. laughs> yeah. and God's word is always fresh. But you get that. You've heard that, Rev. Williams, right? Yeah, like, right. Or like then you have, have you heard, we want a rhema word. Yeah, I've heard that. I don't know if people be using that <laughs> properly, but I'm gonna leave that alone. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that, that's why I mentioned it. It's, it's way out of context. A rhema word. But anyway, they want a fresh word, a fresh, uh, a, you know, uh, they want this. And sometimes, I th even even though, even some as preachers, we oftentimes get them to say, oh, Lord, give me a fresh anointing. Why would the last anointing be have faded? Right? The story, mm -hmm. what they said about, uh, uh, they said that, uh, Oh, you know what the Bible said about uh, oh how good it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like oil poured over the over over Aaron running down to his beard. Beard, uh, yes. There, I guess there was a saying that Aaron was so anointed that even to the day he died, there were droplets of oil still in his beard for when he got anointed the first time. If the anointing worked the first time, why do you need to be anointed again? And so she, they. I think that Manoah wanted the angel to give him something extra, right? Mm -hmm. and all he got was do what I told you the first time. And I wonder sometimes, um, I read this book recently and one of the, it was written by these two authors. It's called Discipleship Is, I think that's the name of the book. But anyways, the authors dropped, dropped something in my spirit and they said, what if we did everything Jesus commanded? would our church look different? And I was like, mm, that thing, that thing hit you in the chest a little bit. If we just did everything Jesus already said, right? All of us are waiting for Jesus to come back. And Jesus is like, you can't even handle what I've told you to do before. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, um, you know, most of y'all uh, are key, you know, have grandkids or you raise children and you, your kids always questioning, well, they always want something new. You like, you ain't taking care of the old stuff I gave you. Why should I buy you something new, right? If you can't take care of them, he means I bought you last year for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I buying you new he man for this, this year for Christmas? You've shown that you, you know, you've already shown me who you are. All right, and so, look, and so look what he tries to do. Next step is he tried to hit him with the hospitality, right? Stay here until we make a young goat for you, right? Now, it was, let me try to say this. I think Manoa's like, if I can get him to eat, maybe I can get some more information out of him. He ain't give me what I want, right? But if I get you at the dinner table, maybe I can pry some more information out of him. You know how we do, right? And sometimes if we uh, want the tea, as the young people say, we try to, oh, let's go out to eat. So tell me what happened about so, you know, <laughs> try to get you comfortable so we can get more information out of you. All right. Uh, it says, the angel of the Lord didn't reply, even though you detained me. See, look, he he spots what Manoah's trying to do, right? So I'm not going to. Yeah, he picked it up me. quick. But look, he gets some alternative, though. He says, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to who? The Lord. Because the, the, the narrative is letting you know. He don't realize who he's talking to. What he sees is a man and not a divine figure. So what's that saying in the Bible? Um, be careful. How when you, you entertain angels, you a stranger, be, you might be entertaining an angel. There you go. That's what we got going on here. Manoah just, because because the wife is telling him that this is a, a this is a holy person, a holy man. He's like, man, this is just Rick from down the street. I told you this fool is about, about to have a baby. Anybody try? Hey, <laughs> yeah, right. I think I'm Bobo. I think I'm Boo Boo the fool. <laughs> All right. And then he now the next question he wants to know: What is your name? Now, you've seen the same thing when Joshua. That's a Joshua. No, I'm sorry. When um. Uh, Jacob is wrestling the angel. Mm -hmm. What does he ask him? He said, what is your name? Now, remember, keep that in mind as we see this next part. 
Let's read uh, verses 18 through 25. That's a closes out. He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Hmm. Then, Man then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards the heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, the Lord has means to kill us. The Lord had meant to kill us. He would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all of these things, or nor told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanath, Dan, between Zorah and Estiol. All right. A lot going on here. And look, the first thing he says is, Why do you want to know my name? It is beyond understanding. That'll make you want to shout right there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so Manoah prepares, prepares the young goat, sacrifices it, and they watch this angel ascend into the fire. Right? It, we watch the angel of the Lord ascend into the blaze. Right? Now, I'm going to say this. There's a lot of people. Well, there's some scholars who believe when you see in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus precarnation. Now, this isn't a universal theory. There are some people who doubt that, but there are some there are some people who believe that this theory. Right. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is because of what Manoah says. Right. What does he say? In verse 22. And when the angel of the Lord did not show himself, Manoah said to his wife and realized it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die. Why does he say that, Brad Williams? Because you, the Old Testament uh, scriptures teach that you cannot see the Lord. Uh, and live. And live. All right. But you know, but I and when I think of that, mm -hmm. do we have an example where somebody saw the Lord and they died? You know, now that I think about it, I can't recall any specific text off the top of my head that just says, and Rick. So, and so now died. we understand. <laughs> so now I understand why the Lord is making that clear. It says, no, uh, Brother Williams, if you don't want to see me because I'm so holy. Once you see me, then your life is going to be over with. Well, it's the same thing. Remember what he says to Moses when he puts him in the cleft of the rock, right? He says, you can't see my face, but no man can see my face and live. Right. And, and, okay, right. And that's where we're coming from. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's been passed down, you know, through the generations. So, yes. so, cause you remember, even when, uh, even when Jacob wrestles with the angel, what does he say afterwards? I he says, "I'm gonna call you." The angel says, "I'm gonna call you Israel because you wrestle with who? You wrestle with God and live." And he was shocked afterwards that he saw that he says, "I saw the Lord and I lived." Anytime uh, it seemed, it just like I said, there's a couple figures in the Old Testament. You kind of like, hmm, hmm, could this be right? Because if you're talking about Old Testament pre cardation Jesus, would you be able to understand his name? Because I mean, if you look at the names no. of God, the names of God are usually his attributes, right? Jehovah DC, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, they're all yes. pointing to attributes of God, right? You got Yahweh, which is God's name, but like I said. 
would we actually be able to understand the, the names of the Lord, right? All right. So now I like that. Now, now remember I told you, right? Manoah's wife is not named, but she seems to be the star of this text. Cause look what she says to him after he says that. If the Lord meant to kill us, he would not have accepted our burnt offer from us or showed us these things. I could almost, in my in my theological imagination, I could just imagine her like, look at him like, fool. He would <laughs> he wanted to kill us. He would have touched that. Wouldn't be dead. We wouldn't be talking. Right, right, right. She, uh, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, and look what now. Now I want you to pay close attention to verse 24. What does it say in verse 24? Read it real slow. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. Go back now. And this it said the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. She named him Samson. It doesn't necessarily mention it. It doesn't mention Manoah naming him Samson, right? Remember when John the Baptist is born, right? Elizabeth is telling uh is telling the people what? His name's gonna be John. And they ain't right. want to listen to her. And so they go to they go to uh Zachariah and say, Zachariah, hey man, your wife wanna name your kid something crazy. What's the boy's name? His name is John. Like, oh. So if you notice in this text, like I said, even though Samson's uh mother isn't given a name, it doesn't mean that she's not important. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have uh value. And that's the thing I really wanted to lift up uh too. So what can we learn from this text? The biggest thing we can learn from this text is a lot of times we're going to have doubts. I don't beat Manoah up because if Elizabeth ran over here right now and talking about, Bill, I saw an angel. <laughs> he told us we were have a kid. I'm be like, first off, I don't, the gas on over there or something, like you and Layla have been doing something because... <laughs> Take it easy. The <laughs> <laughs> gas leaking the parsons or something. <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm not hearing that, what you're saying right now, right? But so we don't want to beat Manoah up too much because I think sometimes we look back at people in the past, especially in the Bible, and we say, oh, that'd have been me. I would, uh, uh, would you know? You don't know unless you're in that situation, right? It's like a lot of people say, oh, if this happened, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm, would you? You know, a lot of times you say the stuff that you would do, but you don't actually, you know, but you'll actually live up to it. So what I want to really lift up today is I really wanted, I really wanted to highlight another strong female character in the Bible. And uh, just like Mary, she seems to be a minor player, but she ends up being a major, she does have a major role in Samson's upbringing. Now, like I said, if you get a chance, please go and read uh, the story of Samson, especially in light of what we just talked about. It really brings to light a lot of things about Samson's life to make you go, I don't know about this. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns, anything? Let's talk about it. I'll be using this for a Mother's Day text. That's a good one. It's a good one. I got a good uh I got a good word out of that one. Because the first thing I thought of when I looked at the text was uh just because you don't have a name don't mean you don't have a purpose. I said, Ooh, that'll preach all day mm -hmm. long, twice on Sunday. And now and and your uh underlying subject today was uh faith over doubt. Yeah. Okay. Because if you look at it, you see in both you see both sides of the coin, Manoah's mother, I mean not Manoah's mother. Samson's mother seems to be the one of faith, right? Even if you look at the end when she says to Manoah, if God was going to kill us, why would he show, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's the one who seems to be operating in faith. He's the one who seems to be operating in doubt. And that's not uncommon in a lot of marriages uh, for one person. And it, and it can fluctuate for one person in certain situations to have faith. And the other one report, you know, other one could have, another one has doubts. And so it happens. It happens all the time. So it's not uh it's not uncommon. Uh, and it also demonstrates that her faith was based on the word of God that shows that she was a student of the Old Testament. Yeah, because notice now, she doesn't take the word and hides it in her heart, right? First thing she does is go tell her husband. 
I met a man. He told me that I was going to have a baby. So, like I said, we don't know because the text doesn't lift up if she was requesting a kid or still praying to God for a baby or, you know, or anything like that. The text doesn't say that. So I don't want to, you know, sometimes people read into the, I don't want to read into the text and say, oh, she was asking. No, it never says that she's asking for a kid, but there might be, there's some hints that maybe this was a longing of her heart because like I said, as soon as she gets the word, she runs and tells, she runs and tells somebody, right? And uh, I think that's powerful in and of itself that once she gets the word, she doesn't hold on to it. She lets somebody else know. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All righty. Nope. Got one. No. Hey. Not talking because we are working, but we are listening. Okay. <laughs> I'm very willing to do all that reading. <laughs> yeah, they're uh they're busy over there trying to get our Christmas cards done so we can get those out. So we want to thank uh both of them for their diligence uh today. All right, if there's nothing else, we're gonna go ahead and close out. Thank you guys for being on. I need to I need to shoot a message to Reverend Parrish to remind folks. That we're still doing this again at seven o'clock tonight. I uh, hope to see you. But thank all of you for being on today. Let's close out in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Want to your word. We thank you, God, that your word is reigning true in our spirits. And we're asking, Father, right now that you begin to open our eyes and our hearts to maybe some areas where we're, we have doubts, some areas where we don't trust you like we should. And we're asking, Father, that you begin to move us into your right direction. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. All right, y'all. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. You're All right. Bye. 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 Bye